Hello and thanks for joining. My name is Rebecca Hubbard and I'm the program director with Our Fish. Thank you very much for joining us for today's media briefing, Fishy Decisions, uh, an explainer on EU, Norway and UK fishing limits for 2022. We will get started in just one minute. Okay, so on behalf of the organizing NGOs, I'd like to welcome you all here today. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. You know, it's very busy across the EU right now. As I said, my name's Rebecca Hubbard. I'm the program director for Our Fish, which is a European campaign to end overfishing and restore healthy ocean ecosystems as action to address the biodiversity and climate emergency. We have language interpretation in Spanish, French, German, and English today. So to listen and speak in your preferred language, please click on the world symbol at the bottom of the Zoom screen and choose the language you prefer. Today's briefing will be recorded and made available after the event in all languages. So this briefing is brought to you by Owlfish, Oceana, Seas at Risk, Client Earth, BUND, Ecologistas en Acción, Siena, France, Natur Environment, Dutch Elasma Brank Society, and the Danish Society for Nature Conservation. In today's briefing, we'll provide you with key background information on how the process of setting fishing limits between the EU, UK, and Norway in the Northeast Atlantic will happen for 2022. We'll provide insights into which fish populations are most at risk, which areas are suffering the most, and provide you with key questions to ask ministers and the commission when reporting on the setting of these fishing limits. Uh, a small bit of context for those who don't know, for many years, the EU, UK and Norway have ignored scientific advice ignored evidence of illegal discarding of fish and ignored the impact of indiscriminate fishing methods on ocean ecosystems in the Northeast Atlantic. There has been some progress, but this uh, refusal to take on the evidence and to listen to the scientific advice has taken a toll on our seas, the marine life and the ocean's capacity to mitigate and adapt to climate change. There have been many European and international reports, meetings and statements in recent times that all commit to ending this war on nature. Hot on the heels of the COP26 increased commitment to enhance ocean climate action, the EU, UK and Norway, fisheries ministers can and must show that their decision-making will match their government's promise-making. Ending overfishing is not just the bare minimum when it comes to ocean and climate action or the law, it's immediately achievable and delivers maximum co-benefits for biodiversity, food security and communities. And anything else is just short-term political deal-making. We'll have three presentations of approximately seven minutes each, and then we'll open for questions. We hope we'll be done within one hour. Um, if you'd like to put your questions in the chat, you can do, or you can wait until the Q&A at the end, and then raise your hand. You can turn your video on or use the icon. For those people who have just joined, thank you so much for joining us and taking the time. 
uh, if we do have interpretation in Spanish, French, German and English, so please be sure to choose your language at the bottom of the screen. So first speaker I will hand over to is Jenny Grossman from Client Earth, who will present uh, setting fishing limits on how does it work, the processes and the law. Thanks, Jenny. Thank you very much for the introduction back. Um, can everybody see my screen? I'm just gonna put this into presentation mode. Great, okay, um, let's crack on. The first question, how big is the pie and how do we split it? Or in other words, how much fish is there actually in the sea? How much of it can we catch sustainably? And how do we share all this fish? So the first step of the process is always data collection, which then feeds into scientific advice, um, which then goes into this, well, as I've displayed here, into this negotiation black box, which happens mostly behind closed doors. And at the end of that, we get the fishing limits or also referred to as total allowable catches or TACs. Sometimes when NGOs like ourselves have our way, they are actually set below the scientific advice. For example, when there are species like sand eel, which are important food sources for other parts of the ecosystem like seabirds. But more often than that, fishing limits are just set at the maximum advice level or sadly quite often above that. How do we share this? Basically, there's two key approaches there. The first one is um, we have an agreement about which percentage of the fishing limit goes to which party. The second approach is there is no such agreement. So basically, each party just claims whatever piece of the pie they think belongs to them, which you can imagine can result in tensions and also issues for the fish stocks. The first out of four processes I want to talk about is the setting of fishing limits for EU only stocks. So there's two main fora that meet annually. The first one is the October Council, which um, deals with 10 stocks in the Baltic. And then we also have the December Council, which is now mostly focusing on certain stocks in these more southern waters that you can see there at the bottom and a couple of stocks in the Kattegat. Brexit has had quite a big impact on this process and on the scope of it because the majority of the fish stocks that used to fall under this process are now actually shared between the EU and the UK. The process starts with the Commission publishing a proposal on what the fishing limit should be. This then gets discussed with the Member States and at the end the Council of EU Fisheries Ministers comes together and sets the fishing limits for the next year. Some examples of stocks you might have come across are the Eastern and Western Baltic Cod, which are both in pretty bad shape. And then for the December Council, for example, Pollack and Southern Hague. For Pollack, one thing I wanted to mention is it's an interesting example where the data are quite limited, but we do have precautionary advice from scientists, which quite frequently gets ignored. The second uh, process is the management of EU UK shared stocks, which is a new one that came in through Brexit. And as I said, it covers the majority of the stocks that used to fall under the December Council. So this is all governed by the new trade and cooperation agreement or the Brexit agreement between the EU and the UK that was agreed at the start of this year. And it's a new international process where the Commission negotiates on behalf of the EU with the UK um, and this is based on a mandate from the Council. There's a couple of negotiation rounds and the first one for the next year has just happened last week and after a couple of weeks hopefully there will be an agreed written record which lays down the agreed fishing limits. The percentage share that goes to the UK and the EU respectively is already fixed in the Brexit agreement. Some examples of stocks you might have heard of are Celtic Sea and West of Scotland Cod, as well as Irish Sea Whiting. So one thing that these three have in common is that they are all quite vulnerable stocks that are normally caught in by as bycatch in other fisheries, and they're all in quite bad shape. And the last example I wanted to mention is this little guy here, sand eel, that I mentioned before, which is quite a big contentious point between the EU and the UK. The third process is um, involving Norway. So it's essentially the same process, but with three parties and it covers eight stocks 
um, as well as some discussions on some not yet jointly managed stocks like Northern Hague, and is mostly centered around the North Sea. Examples that you'll be familiar with are North Sea Cod, which you'll hear about in the next presentation, Haddock, and Say. And now the final process I want to mention is uh, the coastal states process, where those three parties that we already heard about, EU, UK, and Norway, negotiate together with other third countries, including Iceland, the Faroe Islands, Greenland, and also to some extent Russia, at least as an observer. And they basically negotiate how um, widely distributed fish stocks and a couple of deep sea stocks should be managed. And one of the key issues is what I touched upon at the start is that there is no sharing arrangements for some of these stocks, meaning that everybody claims what they think their share of the pie should be, which often leads to overfishing. And one key example here is the quite widely distributed mackerel where this is an issue. So one thing that all of these um, negotiations have in common that they involve this um, black box of the negotiations, which offers part of the explanation how it can keep happening that fishing limits are set above scientific advice and not in line with the law. And the key issue here is the lack of transparency, which makes it quite difficult to hold anyone specifically accountable for the, well, as we call them, fishy decisions, as the title of this briefing, that come out of these negotiations. There have been some improvements, for example, in the current year, for the first time, NGOs have been allowed alongside industry members to participate in some parts of the plenaries of the, of the negotiations, but there's still quite a long way to go. For example, the documentation of these discussions and who said what, so who is to blame for what, um, is still quite limited. The next key question is what's actually in the law, so which rules do all these parties actually have to follow? And there's quite a few that are enshrined both domestically, for example, within the EU and the UK, but also internationally, for example, in the Brexit agreement. And I don't want to get too technical here, but I want to highlight four key principles and rules for you. So the first one is to follow the science when setting fishing limits. The second one, closely linked to that, is to end overfishing, which is basically to use the maximum sustainable yield, or MSY, as a limit. This is basically the maximum amount of fish that you can catch in the long term without jeopardizing the long term productivity and health of the stocks. And thirdly, it's to be more cautious when you know less. So the precautionary approach, and this is what is actually violated in the case of this Pollack stock that I mentioned at the start, where the precautionary advice that we do have keeps getting ignored. And fourthly, we've got um, the need to consider ecosystem needs and impacts. So that's touching on some of the issues that I've mentioned, like bycatch, the need for food within the ecosystem, for example, for seabirds, and also the need to mitigate certain other pressures on the ecosystem, like climate change. There's also two key legal deadlines. The first one is the EU's deadline to end overfishing by 2020. This is a deadline that we have already missed, obviously, but it still applies going forward. So fishing unsustainably is technically illegal. And the second deadline is a new one between the EU and the UK to reach agreement on fishing limits for shared stocks by the 10th of December or the very latest, the 20th. And the default, if no such agreement is reached, is to follow the science. So this takes me to my final slide, which is a reminder to us all that setting fishing limits in line with science and the law is a very important step, but it's just step one of a long journey towards real sustainability. And there's a number of other issues that need to be addressed to make sure that these fishing limits are truly sustainable. So illegal discarding needs to be tackled by ensuring proper control and monitoring. Vulnerable bycatch stocks need to be restored. Sharing arrangements need to be agreed for stocks like mackerel. And the list goes on and on and on and on. But the key take home message for us all here is that we all need to treat with caution what we hear, especially in the coming weeks from decision makers about sustainable fishing limits, because we need to make sure that we have sustainability on the water and not just on paper. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thanks, Jenny. That was excellent. Really great overview of what can be a quite complicated process. 
So next up, we have Valeska Dimel from BUND. And Valeska is going to be presenting the state of the stocks and European seas, overfishing past and present and iconic fish at risk. Over to you, Valeska. Thank you so much, Beck. I'm also just going to share my screen with you. Okay, perfect. Do you all see that? Great, perfect. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Valeska and I'm the Fisheries Policy Officer at Bund. And we are a German member organization of Seas at Risk. In the next couple of minutes, I will run you through the current status of fish stocks in the Northeast Atlantic and present to you in more detail the dramatic situation of one of our most iconic fish species, uh, which is the Atlantic cod. So if we want to look at how the progress to end overfishing is going, there are two important values we can look at. And the first value is the fishing pressure. So that means how much fish is actually taken from the ocean by fisheries. And if this fishing pressure is above the maximum sustainable value, the MSY that Jenny just talked about, then a stock is considered overfished. The second value we look at is the biomass to assess if the stock has a healthy size and can reproduce sufficiently. If the biomass of the stock is below the critical reference point uh, estimated by scientists, we consider the stock outside safe biological limits. And what you can see here is the trend in stock status published by the Scientific Technical and Economic Committee for Fisheries of the EU um, from their report from 2020. And among the stocks which are fully assessed, the proportion of overfished stocks has decreased from around 75% to close to 40% over the last 10 years. However, in 2019, proportion of overfished stocks has increased slightly again. So this is uh, the blue line. The proportion of stocks outside safe biological limits, which is the yellow line, follows the same decreasing trend from 75% in 2003 to around 30% in 2018. But also here we can see a substantially increase again in 2019. It is also important to note that in 2019, only 40% of all stocks in the Northeast Atlantic are simultaneously not overfished and inside safe biological limits, which means that 60% are either overfished or outside safe biological limits. So let's take a closer look um, at one of our most iconic fish that is currently at risk and actually has been for a very long time, which is the European cod. So the scientific assessment of cod stocks across Europe shows that almost all of them are in a critical state, requiring a drastic cut in catches as soon as possible. What we show here is the current fishing pressure that I just talked about. So what is taken from the ocean and the size of the current spawning stock biomass. So how many fish are out there that can reproduce, rebuild and grow the stock? One red cross here means that the status is bad and two mean that the status is absolutely abysmal. The question mark means basically that the available data is not sufficient for an assessment of the reference points. So you can see very clearly here that the situation for all stocks is either unsure or really, really bad. Caught in the Irish Sea is at the lowest level ever. The population in the Celtic Sea has been reduced by 88% since the 1980s. In the North Sea too, cod overall has declined by nearly 70% since the late 60s. And the population that swims off the west coast of Scotland has fallen by 94% since 1981. So out of the six cod stocks shown here, three actually have a scientific tech advice of zero tons for 2022, while the remaining three tags are quite small. You can see 14 tags for the Rockland cod and 74 tons for the Irish sea cod. And also if you um, look at the tag for the North Sea, um, respectively for the big area, this tag is four, it's also quite small. 
So if we um, go one step to the right, so this way, um, there is the Kattegat and there things are not really any better. The biomass of the Kattegat cod reached a historical low in 2020. This stock also has a zero catch advice and all targeted fishing is closed. The two populations of cod in the Baltic Sea um, that were decided in October Council are also collapsed basically and all targeted fishing for cod in the Baltic is now closed uh, with only a small bycatch tag that was agreed. This mismanagement of cod even gets like a completely new dimension um, when we look at the actual catch details from 2020. So this is exactly what Jenny meant when she said we need to make sure that uh, the tech is not only sustainable on paper, but actually sustainable underwater. So this graph shows the actual catches on the water of North Sea cod in ISIS area four in weight in tons. And the data is taken from this year's ISIS advice. So for 2020, ISIS recommended a maximum catch of 13,600 tons. This is the green bar. But fisheries ministers already set a higher catch quota and exceeded this advice by 8%. This is the blue bar. And if this was not enough and illegal, due to caught bycatch in mixed fisheries, the real catch landed that year was much higher than the catch quota. This is the gray bar. In addition, there was a large number of cod that were illegally discarded back into the sea. That's the orange bar. So taking all of this together, the real catch of North Sea cod in 2020 was 34% higher than the officially agreed tech and 45% higher than the scientific advice. So despite the 2020 deadline to end overfishing in the EU, the state of fish stocks in the Northeast Atlantic is not good and progress is made too slow. Moving forward, Europe needs a more joined up approach that considers the impacts of fishing on the whole marine ecosystem and recognizes the need to limit the pervasive reach of fisheries if we are really going to restore fish populations and open health. For the ongoing negotiations on fishing opportunities in the Northeast Atlantic for 2020, we ask fisheries ministers to end overfishing and set all tax at or below scientific advice. To take into account the bycatch in mixed fisheries and set certain tax below the maximum single species advice to protect the weakest stocks like the cods. Consider that some species are also heavily impacted by the climate crisis and include to include an additional climate buffer when setting the tax and to make selective gear mandatory to reduce bycatch and increase control and monitoring measures to ensure compliance with the landing obligation. Thanks so much. Excellent, thanks Valeska. That was also a very clear, but somewhat devastating picture of the poor beleaguered European cod. So finally, we have Javier Lopez from Oceana to present on the future of fishing in Europe, lessons learned from the first year of post-Brexit tax setting and uh, considering the changing climate that we're facing. Thanks, Javier. Thank you, Rebecca. <clears throat> so give me one second. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Javier Lopez and I'm the Fisheries Campaign Director for Oceana in Europe. My 10 minutes presentation today uh, will be focused on two topics. On one hand, I will summarize some of the lessons learned in relation to the setting of the 2021 fishing opportunities in the Northeast Atlantic. The first one that has been adopted after Brexit and on the other hand, I will try to provide thoughts or clues about the current negotiations for the setting of the 2022 fishing limits. Oops. Okay. So as it was expected, and the UK's departure from the European Union is having a huge impact on the management of the fish stocks, including the setting of, 
of the catch limits. And Brexit has shifted uh, the balance of power in the Northeast Atlantic and has provoked as well changes in the decision making process. So it provides an opportunity to break to break the status quo for the better or for the worse. This is to be confirmed. And on the specific lessons learned, a few of them, I will start with um, saying that the parties are willing to cooperate, but there is pressure to identify themselves as winners. So regardless of the common understanding that shared stocks need shared management measures, the high interconnection in fisheries of all parties such the situation that the European Union is catching around 30% of the, of the catches in UK waters and around 70% of the UK seafood production is exported to the European Union. Uh, this situation also encouraged the, the cooperation and collaboration among all the parties. Anyhow, it seems clear that the UK must show itself as a, as a winner because of the, of the Brexit process. And also the other parties have to show that Brexit doesn't have a negative impact on the on the on the fleets. Second lesson learned is that decision on catch limits continue to be driven by non-environmental factors. Science con continues to be ignored, as has been already explained by Valeska. So so far, most of the discussions related to the setting of catch limits have been focused on topics not strictly related with environmental sustainability. So most of the discussion has been around the access to water, so the allocation key of the catch limits among the different parties. But the reality is that when implementing all the agreements they have reached, these framework agreements, um, parties are reluctant to implement the scientific advice, mainly from data limited assessments and when the scientific advice is recommending a strong reductions in catches. So this confirms that the decision making is, is biased and is driven by short-term socioeconomic interest rather than the environmental or the long-term socioeconomic uh, interest. Next one is transparency in the decision making process has not been improved as Jenny has as well provide some, some thoughts about it. So despite the rights of the citizens to get access to the environmental information and the public uh, participation in the decision making, parties are still reluctant to increase the transparency in the decision making process. So for example, the positions of all the parties for these consultations or negotiations are not made public, are not shared with the stakeholders, and the records of the negotiations are not or either uh, share with, with the stakeholders. This makes not only difficult to participate effectively in this decision-making process, but also make impossible to, to, to make all the parties accountable for the final decision, as you don't know what each party is defending in, in these negotiations. Next one is that fisheries is, is a still, or is a totemic topic, but so far, uh, fisheries and not fisheries disputes are not affecting the catch, limit, the catch limits decisions. So regardless the relative low economic relevance or significance of the fishing activity, fishing continues to be a totemic topic for all parties. Being on the, on the spot makes fishing a very political topic that not always is affecting the outcome of the negotiations for the better. Uh, and however, despite this mediatic uh, relevance of, of, the, of fisheries, I have to say that paradoxically, fisheries and non-fisheries disputes are not really having uh, an impact on the, on the decision on catch limits. And our perception is that uh, this is because these, these disputes are kept at, at a much higher political level. But as I said, uh, yeah, these disputes are not having any, any impact on, on, the, on the real decision on the catch limits. And the, least, and the latest lesson learned is that the setting of catch limits, limits is carried out outside any climate change uh, consideration. So it's totally outrageous. 
to see how potential uh, mitigation and adaptation measures related to the setting of catch limits are ignored and these are not really contributing to, to fight uh, against the, the climate change. So on one hand, we have that the scientific advice is lacking the climate change component, but this is mainly because the decision makers are not asking for it. But the, the members, no, the member states, sorry, the decision makers can really um, start implementing this, this approach as it will be very easy for them to reduce the catch limits for certain fishing gears that are responsible for high rates of CO2 emissions like bottom trolling that, by the way, release a lot of CO2 from the bottom to the water column, or they could uh, adopt uh, lower catch limits uh, to those, those species that are vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. So they provide a climate buffer to, to these species and make them more resilient to these impacts. And this is something that has been as well commented by, by Valeska in her presentation. So an overall conclusion from the lessons learned is that there is no strong evidence that after Brexit, the setting of catch limits has become more sustainable and more efforts are, are still needed to, to end overfishing. On what is next and what to expect. So the first thing that I'm going to share with you is about the, the timing and the deadline. So negotiations for catch limits for the share stocks are already in place, as uh, Jenny was commenting. And for example, this week is the second round of negotiations between the European Union and the UK and among the European Union, UK and, and Norway. Parties are meeting almost every week and the duration of this year negotiations are expected to, to last a few weeks, which is much shorter than the previous or the negotiations for the 2021 catch limits, which lasted around four or five months. And, and the difference between the situation of both is because um, some of the difficult topics to be agreed and discussed like the inter-area flexibility, increasing the inter-area flexibility that was proposed by the UK uh, last year or this year, early this year, uh, are not supposed to, to suffer a strong, a strong changes. In relation to the exclusive European Union uh, catch limits, the decision is going to be adopted during the December Agri-Fish Council. And also by this time, the European Union has in mind to transpose or to ratify any, any possible agreement on share stocks with other third parties. So this is on the timeline and the, and the deadlines. Um, moving into the, the what to expect or what is the potential outcome of, of, the, of the negotiations for, for next year. Um, I will say that uh, as said before, all parties are willing, are keen to, to find an agreement on catch limits because there is a lot of inter interconnection about uh, among them. Mm, and also the, the fact that they, this year they are meeting in person can also facilitate uh, the negotiations. It has to be also noted that in the case of the European Union and the UK, in case they do not reach an agreement, they will have to set unilateral TACs on the basis of the provisions agreed in the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. But this is something that has been highlighted as well by Jenny in her presentation. But unfortunately, in the feedback that we have received from, from all parties is that they, that obviously it's easy to, to reach an agreement when all of them are willing to ignore the scientific advice when it's necessary. So as said in my previous slide, um, parties are not keen to adopt strong reductions in catches where, where are needed. But I have to say as well that on the positive side, the UK seems to be more progressive when it comes to the implementation of the ecosystem-based approach. So as Jenny as well said, they are willing to adopt catch limits below the maximum threshold advised uh, by, by the scientists for some forest fish species. These are small pelagic species that are mainly prey of other um, uh, wildlife, like uh, marine wildlife, like the marine mammals or seabirds or other commercial species. 
and this is really uh, a good step forward. But also I have to say that the UK has not really a strong interest in the fishing of these industrial fisheries or forest fish species. On the other side, we have the European Union, which is more willing to adopt larger cuts in the catch limits for the severely overexploited stocks, also not to the extent that the scientific advice is recommending. So for this year, as it happened last year, it remains to be seen whether the new dynamic between the European Union and the UK will lead to a race to the top or to the bottom, no? So this is something to, to be confirmed. And finally, the overall aspect, expected outcome of the decision on the 2022 catch limits is that there will be, there will no be really a, a breakthrough or a significant improvement in the management of the Northeast Atlantic fish stocks. And unfortunately, uh, parties will continue missing the 2020 deadline to end overfishing that they have agreed in their domestic and, and international, uh, well, domestic regulation and international commitments. And that's all from, from my side. Thank you. Thanks, Javier. Excellent um, recap on the politics, which is the obvious overlay uh, with the science. Um, so now we can take questions and answers uh, or have a conversation. Um, please consider this like a face-to-face -face press briefing. Imagine we're all in the room together. You can turn your videos on if you would like to ask a question and or um, use the hand raising tool. And remember that you can choose your own language. If you prefer, you can ask a question in um, Spanish, German or French as well. Uh, okay, Raf, you did put your camera on first, although I see Jennifer's hand up as well. Um, well done. Jennifer, you go first. You're in the lineup first. Thank you. Thank you. You can hear me, I hope. You can hear me? Yes. Okay. And thank and sorry. Sorry to jump ahead of Raf. Um, so thanks very much for these presentations. Very clear and helpful. I wanted to ask um, about the UK government claims to be more sustainable because you often hear from British ministers that as a result of leaving the CFP, the UK can now change its bylaws in order to, for example, build marine parks like the marine park they are proposing for Dogger Bank. How do you assess what the UK government is doing in general and in particular at Dogger Bank? Do you think that they really are um, offering some kind of prospect to, to rescue the sea life in those areas? and? And at the very beginning, sand deal was mentioned. Could you go into some details as to what the issue is here? Thank you. Great, great question. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, so I also just wanted to point out, which I forgot to mention, is that we have uh, campaigners and policy officers from a range of the countries in the EU, including Germany, France, Spain, Denmark, the Netherlands, uh, so if you have a specific question for a specific country, you can also uh, please nominate a question or a place. Uh, but Irena, would you like to have a go at responding to Jennifer's question? So yeah, I'm sorry, there's somebody hoovering in the background. I hope there's not too much interference. Um, sorry, I'm Irene Kigma. I work for the Dutch Lesbrink Society. We also know quite a bit about the Dogger Bank. So I thought maybe I'll take this question. Um, so, um, Dogger Bank is a complicated story, a long story. Um, from my perspective, what the UK is proposing is brave and good on the Dogger Bank. It's also very easy, just like Javier pointed out that they were just saying of forage fish, it's very easy when it's not your fisheries that you're impacting. So what we are very much seeing is that the UK is being very progressive on all environmental issues as long as it's not interfering with their own fishing interest. So they are good at ICAT now because it's mako shark fish by the Spanish. They're good at the dogger bank because it's 
um, flat fish fish by the Dutch and they're good at uh, the forage fish industrial fisheries because it's that's fish by the Danish. What we're see also seeing is they're very much not willing to move on cod when it's the Scottish fishing those. So it's um, it's a mixed bag, and it's also what uh, what what Javier was saying. Nobody wants to be seen to be losing. Everybody wants to be to, to seen as the winner. Um, and that's for us, for us. It's an interesting situation because we are still chatting to our UK colleagues, and the UK is not, and, and the, the EU is not. Thanks, Irena. And Javi, you might like to make a comment as well. Yes, thank you. So thanks for the question, Jennifer. And I will back what Irene has said. My perception in the examples that you have asked about is that the, the UK is playing an opportunistic game. Because as Irene has said, we understand that the UK has not a strong interest in the industrial fisheries, in the forest fish fisheries. And the UK has not uh, either a strong interest in fishing in the Dover Bank. So it's easy for them to, to be progressive. Says so, we welcome these initiatives. I mean, we appreciate that the, the UK is interested in banning the use of bottom trolling in Doggerback to protect the habitats, and that the UK is willing to set really low TACs in order to make abundant the forest fish, so the world marine ecosystem is benefiting from, from this situation. Uh, and also, in a selfish way, we make use of this position to try to push the European Union to, to, to move ahead in, the, in this direction. So I'm happy that the UK is taking position or is taking this position in these both topics, but I would like to see as well uh, similar attitudes for, for other, other situations. Yeah, thank you. Thank, if I can just jump in with one, a couple of points to clarify and thanks both for the helpful answers. Irina, you mentioned the COD on the west of Scotland. Do, do you mean that the UK is still looking for um, attack that is above scientific advice, just to clarify that. And then also the, on the question about sand eel, is that one of the species at issue at, at Dogger Bank? And would somebody be able to say a few words about that, what the, what the stakes are here? Um, on the, we understood from a briefing from the commission that uh, the UK is still looking for a rollover on cod on the west of Scotland. That's the information we have now. Um, I can also tell you about sand eel. Sand eel is not on the Dogger Bank. It, it is a species that lives on the flats in the, um, uh, in, in, in the North Sea, but that's fished by the Danish, for, mainly for their fishery for them, yeah, for um, uh, fish meal. Sorry, fish meal, that's the word, I'm so, sorry. Fish meal, sorry. And now I'm closing the Excellent. Does that answer your question, Jennifer, or did you want to follow up? I think that the uh, that the vacuuming in the background has um, played with it. And is... sorry, it's it's now stopped. But it, yeah, the sand eel, so the sand eel fishery is, um, and the problem there is that it's uh, a fishery that's uh, very needed for especially sand bird, uh, bird, seabirds that are like the kittiwigs are very much dependent on this uh, these species for to overwinter and that sort of thing. Uh, they're also impacted, these stocks, by climate change, which also Javier mentioned, and that's not really taken uh, into the models for fisheries. So uh, there isn't a real issue there. And the UK is now saying these stocks are in our water, so that they're not on MPAs, but they're just fished in their waters. So we might as well, they, they, they can actually are in control of uh, restricting access to those stocks. But because they have a TAC attached, they have a, a sort of a quotum attached, the, UK, the EU is now saying, well, they should be part of the trade and cooperation agreement, so we should have just have access to that. So there's an interesting new dynamic where the geographic element of where the stock is is in UK waters, but because of old rights by the Danes, they feel they still should have access to them. And that's an interesting new dynamic. And it's also interesting to see how this changes uh, our role as NGOs and who do we support and where do we say and how it also, the EU now has to sort of reassess their uh, stance on this. And right now they're not really good on, at least on these, for, they're called forage fish, these tiny fish that are essential key part of the ecosystem. They're not taking a very strong role on these. The EU Great. Um, thanks, Irena, and thanks, Jennifer, for the question. If you don't have any follow-up questions, we'll go to Raf. 
Yes, hi. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I was uh, on, on the EU-UK uh, issues. I was a little bit confused because on one hand, uh, we are not seeing uh, or can't assess any impact on the catch quotas uh, yet. And But on the other hand, that we can see that they might well ignore uh, scientific advice. So I was looking on some guidance after this first week of talks uh, what kind of, uh, you know, where are the lines? Will we actually see a race to the bottom uh, for the fish or not? Or how will that happen? What are your indications so far on that? Thank you. Who would like to respond to Raf's comment? I think that Javier slightly did reference this in terms of some of the feedback that we've had thus far from the negotiating parties that we're still getting some indications that they are not going to consider the scientific advice as a hard upper limit but Jenny would you like to elaborate oh sorry am I unmuted yes cool um yeah I just wanted to say on that one you might remember from my presentation that it's quite difficult to tell what exactly um, is said by which party throughout the process because it's not very transparent so it can be quite difficult to follow what is actually going on and sometimes we hear more about what the other side is pushing for uh, not really from the side itself but the EU side might drop a comment on what is going on on the UK side and so on so we're kind of piecing together the pieces of the puzzle but we've only had the first round last week um, and haven't had much detailed feedback on what the outstanding points were based on what we've heard there it sounds very similar to the contentious issues that were um basically under discussion in the current year for this year's quotas so that's why we're working off the assumption that probably things are going in a similar direction but minus some of the contentious points that will just be packed until next year as long as they don't relate directly to fishing limits so that's why we're sort of assuming it's probably maybe not business as usual, but the same sort of key issues like the sand eel, as we mentioned before, and bycatch stocks where the advice is zero and nobody really wants to close fisheries because they don't want to damage, um, you know, socioeconomic situation and so on. So those are all the recurring issues, but they're also recurring because they are not fixed. And that's why we keep having to deal with them year after year. Um, one other point I wanted to make um, from Klein Earth, we have a report coming out soon um, which is basically looking at the progress that has been made over the years in the setting of fishing limits that used to look just at the fishing limits set at the December Council process, but it's now also looking at EU-only stocks versus EU-UK shared stocks. So going forward, that will give some sort of baseline as well that we can compare against to see now that the UK is an independent party, are we heading in a better direction or in the worst direction or is it going to stay the same? So if you're interested in some initial sort of numerical findings of the first year of post-Brexit fishing limits, um, we can share that with you after this briefing as well and then keep you in the loop about any updates going forward. But I guess for now, we have one more round this week and then another one next week. And then hopefully, as have you said, there will be a conclusion at the very latest by the 10th of December. And throughout this time, I guess we can stay in touch as well and see if there's any relevant points, but obviously everybody's very cautious about giving away too much about the negotiation positions. And if you ask them directly, can you share with us what you've shared with the other side? Usually the answer is, we understand why you would ask that, but no. <laughs> so it can be quite tricky, even if they're doing good things that they know NGOs will support, they sometimes won't tell us directly. Can I just... Uh... One more question, please. Uh, you know, we're talking about this December 10, and then a few days later, we have the EU, uh, the EU only uh, session. So uh, the December 10, is that a, a firm deadline that cannot spill over into anything uh, else? And what would happen if you don't have such an agreement at, at that time? Go ahead, Jenny. Uh, so, yeah, I saw Javier's hand pop as well. So basically, it's one of those double deadlines where you have the first deadline 10th of December and then there's sort of a backup deadline for the 20th of December. So what it says in the Brexit agreement is that by the 10th of December, both parties should agree on the fishing limits. If they still haven't reached agreement on some of these stocks, then they need to reconvene as soon as possible and try again 
and then the next deadline is the 20th of December. And then basically there's a sort of default in there that says that if you still haven't reached agreement by the 20th of December, then the fallback with a couple of complications, but to simplify it, the fallback is to follow the science. So it means that both sides would then have to set provisional uni unilateral tax in line with the science. Then, of course, all the questions start about what, what does it mean, the science? If you look at the scientific advice, there's usually several scenarios. So it's not super clear cut, but in principle, it's not the worst default to have from an NGO perspective where we say some stocks might actually be better off if there is no agreement, because usually the agreement will be not to go under, but to go over. Thanks, Jenny. That was a pretty comprehensive answer. Did you want to add anything, Javier? No? No, okay. it's fine. Well, if I may, mm -hmm. yes, in the trade and cooperation agreement, it is said that if both parties are not, are not able to agree on a, on a specific uh, catch limit, they should set unilateral quotas, unilateral TACs that should not exceed the scientific advice. But also, I would like to note that the same article opens the possibility to exceed the scientific advice. So they are giving three exceptions. So for stocks for which there is a zero TAC advice, for mixed fisheries stocks, and also for stocks which parties consider require special treatment, they are not really obliged to set the provisional TACs in line with the scientific advice. So as, as Jenny was saying, it's a bit vague, the language, and we are not totally sure in a scenario of no agreement, the unilateral TACs will follow the, the scientific advice. Perhaps one small uh, follow-up. Uh, if we talk about the scientific advice, do both sides uh, set the ISIS as the standard of scientific advice, or does the UK have an independent one? No, it's it's all ISIS. Yeah, so it's 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 both. Sorry to come back in on this. It's it's ICs is I think even officially referred to somewhere in all the, the different provisions. Of course, all the EU countries and also the UK they have their own national institutes which process the data and so on. And so every now and then somebody will come forward with new data and say, oh, but this assumption in the advice looks strange. Maybe we should look into that. So there are sometimes attacks from different sides um, on the official advice, but generally. Um, it's it's peer reviewed and it's basically internationally accepted as the main source. I just wanted to add to what um, uh, Javier said about special stocks. It's a bit of a gray zone at the moment because you might have heard as well that the Brexit agreement also um, was supposed to set up a specialized committee on fisheries, which was supposed to deal uh, to be a forum for discussions not directly related to fishing limits, but other fishing uh, fisheries management questions. And that was supposed to be set up by summer this year already and it hasn't and one of the tasks of this committee would have been to basically define further what are special stocks and um, so which stocks actually fall under this exception and how uh, what guidelines should we use in managing them so there's a bit of a gray zone now so i think it's quite clear from what we've heard so far from both sides that everyone is quite keen to reach an agreement because nobody really wants to know what the fallback is if they don't um so yeah, we just have to stay tuned on this one, I think. Thanks, Jenny. Um, please put your hand up or uh, turn your video on if you'd like to ask a question. I did want to also mention that one thing that we haven't uh, discussed or presented on today is the Western Mediterranean multi-annual plan but this will be discussed during the December Agrifish Council as well. And we understand that France, Spain and Italy are strongly opposing its implementation despite the dire state, state of the Mediterranean Sea and its fish populations, which are uh, around 83% of, of assessed fish stocks are overfished. So uh, this issue is going to be discussed at Agrifish and in the plan and according to scientific advice, uh, reductions in fishing effort are still necessary to achieve sustainable exploitation, quite substantial reductions in fact. And we think that this will become uh, quite a serious debating point during the council. So if anyone, any of the reporters uh, are covering this issue, then um, do feel free to also ask questions as Agnes 
uh, has her hands up. This is um, an issue that a number of us are covering. Agnes, did you want to come in as well? Yes, I would like to add to that. Uh, my name is Agnes Lishik. I'm a senior policy advisor for Oceana in Brussels office. And I like to call your attention to the Mediterranean also because the Mediterranean has a different regime. So we have tax and quotas, catch limits that are set annually for the Atlantic. In the Mediterranean, we do not have this kind of uh, catch limits. We only have so-called Nasat Sea. That means that uh, the fishing activity is controlled by time, not by how much they fish. So um, there is a multi-annual uh, multi Western Mediterranean plan in, in force since uh, two years now that the European member states agreed to. But now the problem is that France, Italy, and Spain do not want to follow and implement because there are some heavy reductions of uh, fishing effort at around 10%. It is decided every year by, by scientific advice and then proposed by the commission. So there's a very strong resistance from the Mediterranean European countries to follow with the implementation of a law that actually they adopted in the council. So this will have an impact on the agrofish Atlantic tax and quotas, because as you know, the power dynamic in the council is a bit tit for tat. If you uh, do this for me in the Atlantic, I will uh, return the favor in the Mediterranean and vice versa. So uh, we think that this will really delay the whole negotiation process and uh, contaminate the Atlantic uh, negotiations, which are already complicated enough. So. Uh, it's important to have an eye on France, also how France will be doing on that, because as you know, they are taking over the European presidency in January. So uh, they should at least uh, implement the European law, not to say the least. Thank you. Thanks, Agnes. Um, so happy to take further questions about that issue if anyone has them. So in response to the question from Patricia, uh, which stocks are particularly sensitive and which should be monitored during negotiations? So I think Valeska, uh, you covered off on uh, the COD, which I think is uh, definitely, well, COD in all of the regions is very sensitive and definitely worth following. Um, do you want to say anything extra on that? Um, I can, yes. So I mean, there like depends on the region, of course, you're interested in. But if we like stay in that area, we have, um, despite the, the cod stocks, which are all worth like having an eye on, we have other stocks um, that are actually doing very bad and have a zero catch advice. And um, that would be also the um, I receive whiting, for example, or um, the west of Ireland herring. They're also not um, not doing well and have zero tech advice. And then for um, for Germany, for example, we have a specific eye on the herring in 3A, like the North Sea herring, um, because we have an issue there with um, the Western Baltic spring spawning herring, which is um, in a very bad shape and in October council all, all targeted fishing for this stock has been stopped. But this stock is moving through the Kattegat and the Skagerrak into the North Sea and there it's mixing with this North Sea herring. So we have a, like a very close eye on the tack and we hope um, for basically for closure in this area for the North Sea cod to protect the weak Baltic sea cod uh, stock herring stock. So this is another stock that we have an eye on, but I'm sure that um, for the Western waters, so the uh, more South, like Spain, Portugal, there are different stocks and maybe Cecilia has um, like a follow up on that because that's not my, not my playground to say that. Thanks, Valeska. Go ahead, Cecilia. Yes, thank you. Um, so I'm Cecilia del Castillo, uh, fisheries campaigner in Ecologies Best Nation, uh, Spanish NGO. So yes, um, I think uh, some species such as uh, Southern Hake are very relevant for um, Spain, but also France and Portugal. Uh, this species is been like the biomass of this species has been decreasing uh, during last years, but there is a 
big problem with the data collection on this population. So uh, the ISS advice, so the scientific advice, is asking for the re reduction of the TAC um, in an 18%. But um, I know the position of the Spanish government right now is clearly pushing for not following the scientific advice and asking for a higher tax. So this is a very uh, important species to follow up and to put pressure on Spanish government for sure, but I also think uh, French and Portugal governments. And I also think, um, but I'm not sure um, the sardine it's relevant. Maybe uh, someone from Siena could um, give more detail on this, but yeah, I just would like to highlight the Southern Hague as a very important stock. Excellent, thanks Cecilia. Yeah, the sardine is definitely a sensitive stock or a, 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 not necessarily that it's an extra sensitive fish, but that its population has been heavily overfished and is vulnerable. Uh, having said that, it's not decided normally with the other attacks during for the Northeast Atlantic. Um, it may be discussed uh, during that council, but uh, normally it uh, has a slightly different and unusual uh, process for setting its uh, fisheries management arrangements. And unfortunately, we don't have Gonzalo or Anna from Siena who are experts on the sardine, but if anybody is interested, we can, of course, put you in contact with those, those people. Okay, perfect. So we are now at the end of the hour, unless there are any more questions, then we will wrap up. We will make available the recordings of the uh, briefing and um, Dave has already shared the presentations in the chat, but we will also circulate links to the presentations as well. So we'd just like to thank you all very much for joining us and we hope that you will ask excellent questions to the fisheries ministers and the commission, uh, remind them uh, of their uh, commitment or obligation to deliver on EU and UK and international laws and commitments and yeah, uh, feel free to, to contact us if you would like to ask any more questions. Thanks so much and have a great day. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.